Hey everyone, good evening and welcome. This is the uh, virtual public input session number one for the Michigan Healthy Climate Plans implementation. Uh, my name is Jim Ostrowski and I work in Eagles Environmental Support Division. Uh, glad to have you here with us tonight. Uh, like I said, it's the first of two listening sessions. We'll have another one next week. So this is the first one, the first virtual one we're having. Uh, we've got a lot of people getting logged in right now. I can tell you right now, I got about 47 people on, but we had about 200 and some registered. So we might have quite a few more jump on as we get started. I just want to run through a couple of things for right now. Uh, for right now, the lines are muted until we start taking your comments. Uh, we are recording this public meeting just like we all do with all our public meetings. And we'll be posting it up on the YouTube channel within the next day or so. Uh, we'll send an email out to everyone who registered uh, where you can find that link when we're done today. I want you to keep an eye on the chat because they might be sending out a couple notes to you in the chat if we need to. Um, we are going to be taking comment from you tonight. So I'll be explaining how we're going to do that once we get done with our first couple small presentations. Uh, with that, I'd like to turn it over to Phil Roos. He's the director of Eagle. So uh, he wants to make a couple opening remarks. So Phil, you can go ahead and come on. Thank you, Jim. Hope everybody can see me. Um, I really appreciate you all. I uh, really wanna welcome you and thank you for participating in this public input session. Uh, this really focused on the implementation of the My Healthy Climate Plan. As Jim said, I'm Phil Roos. I'm the director of EGLE. Uh, for those who aren't that familiar with the acronym, it's Environment, Great Lakes, and Energy. Uh, our mission is to protect Michigan's air, land, and water, and uh, the public health of our 10 million residents who depend upon it. And we have a vision for EGLE, uh, which calls for us to be a, a truly enduring national leader in environmental protection across all the work that we do. And we're in doing that, we're pushing the envelope, raising the bar in terms of the protection that we provide citizens across air, land, and water, and every, all of our elements of our programming. Uh, we have already the strongest in the nation lead and copper, copper rule for protecting air or water quality. And we're gonna keep pushing the envelope on that. Um, uh, we have a robust air toxic program uh, that exceeds national standards. We wanna take that to a new level. We're a leader nationally in identifying and addressing PFAS sites. And we're gonna keep pushing that forward and so much more just to give you some examples. So we're interested in just having lots and lots of impact. And now I'm just really proud to say that though it's been part of our portfolio for a few years, now we're really putting into action climate as a key priority within uh, this department. And we have uh, the Office in, excuse me, of Climate and Energy that resides within EGLE, led by Corey Connolly, uh, who uh, leads this wonderful team who's uh, talking to you tonight. We are responsible through that office for driving statewide implementation of the My Healthy Climate Plan, which was uh, launched in 2022. And climate work and the work that's gonna come out of implementing that plan is something that impacts certainly all of Eagle's work in all of our program areas, we're focusing on embedding climate uh, in all the way we do our all of the work of the agency. Uh, but it's something that's going to touch the lives of all Michiganders, uh, from reducing air pollution uh, because we transition to clean energy, uh, cleaner waters with fewer pollutants, a future-proofed economy that embraces the burgeoning many uh, clean energy industries and a lot of other spin-off agencies or industries that are that are part of this transformation. This is a really significant moment that we're here discussing tonight. And it is for a variety of reasons. Uh, we have right now unprecedented, level, unprecedented levels of federal funding that really makes some of this jump-starting of the climate and decarbonization plan possible. As most of you know, I mean, I'm so proud of this. Our state uh, just a couple of weeks ago passed one of the probably top four or five uh, climate energy pack, climate legislation packages, which included 100% clean energy by 2040. It included empowering our uh, Michigan Public Service Commission to consider climate as well as environmental justice in the decisions they make in their regulatory role with the utilities. 
Uh, it included renewables siting reform. It included launching an office of just transition. So we make sure to do all of this in a way that doesn't leave people behind. And also a, a significant increase in our energy efficiency standards. There's a lot packed into those five bills, but it's really exciting time. Um, and the other thing I'd say about the significance of this moment is the urgency could not be greater. I think we all know this. That's why you're on this uh, Zoom call uh, and want to be part of this. Now is the time that we can make these decisions and put in place the actions that are going to decarbonize our economy, that are going to transform our economy and our lives in a really positive way. And I'm just excited that you are part of this by being on this call. This event is really important for a couple of reasons. Uh, with all the momentum that we have, we really have to focus now on implementation because uh, we can have a great plan, but it's nothing unless we figure out the steps that aren't all spelled out in the plan uh, to really put it into place to achieve its goals and hopefully exceed them. And so this session, as Jim said, it's one of two virtual sessions. And we've also done a few in-person sessions all over the state over the last uh, couple of weeks. What we're doing is trying to gather input and ideas on how best to meet the goals and the commitments of the My Healthy Climate Plan through all of our programs and across state government and across the economy. So uh, specifically then within that, um, we're looking to do that. And you'll hear um, our, my colleagues here talk about the Climate Pollution Reduction Grant Program, which is a really important part of this. It's an unprecedented $5 billion federal grant program from the US EPA that has the potential to fund implementation projects and programs across our state. Uh, so there's a real rare opportunity to do what we're doing here tonight, right now. We need your input. We need your ideas. We need your passion and your energy and your hard work. And honestly, we need your heart in this. Uh, thank you so much for being here. And thanks for being part of this important journey. Uh, the world depends on all of us. So thanks for being part of this with us. And have a great uh, show tonight. All right. Thank you. Director Phil Roos for joining us tonight and your comments. We appreciate that. Okay, yeah. at this point, I'm going to bring on Julia Field. Uh, Julia, you there. All right. All right. See you there. Uh, you can go ahead and share your screen. And I think we're going to kick it off with a short presentation by you before we start uh, taking uh, comments or input. We can great. see your screen. Looks good. You can see it. All right. Great. Thanks, Jim, and thank you, Director Roos, for those opening remarks and joining us tonight. Um, let me pull up the slides here. Great, and thank you all for attending. Um, so as Director Roos said, this is the first of two virtual public input sessions on the implementation of the My Healthy Climate Plan. Um, the second will be this coming Monday from 6 to 8 p.m. December 18th. Um, and this comes after we've actually done five in-person events across the state. We started in Detroit a couple weeks ago, then went to Grand Rapids, uh, Flint, Marquette, and ended in Petoskey earlier this week. And so we're doing all these sessions to really get input on the implementation of our My Healthy Climate Plan, which I'll explain a little bit this evening. So tonight, um, just as an overview of how this will work, I'll go over the objectives, talk a little bit more about the My Healthy Climate Plan, then we'll really spend most of this uh, event tonight getting input from you all and we'll be in the kind of listening mode and, and hearing from you. And then finally, we'll conclude with the more information on how to stay in touch and involved in our program. So the objectives for this session today is really about an opportunity to learn from, um, or to learn about Michigan's climate goals and an opportunity to see what Eagle has been coordinating and driving in preparation for the My Healthy Climate Plan implementation. But most importantly, it's a time for you all to provide input about the top climate action priorities in your community, some barriers you may see to implementation of the My Healthy Climate Plan, and finally, environmental justice considerations for Eagle as we consider our planning process. All right, so an executive directive charged Eagle with developing the My Healthy Climate Plan, which is pictured here. The plan was developed with input from hundreds of Michigan residents and stakeholders and was released in April, 2022. The plan lays out a pathway for Michigan to reach carbon neutrality by 2050 while creating good paying jobs and building a healthier and more prosperous, equitable and sustainable Michigan for all Michiganders. 
Through the implementation of the plan, we really have an opportunity to address environmental injustices around communities across Michigan to also help bring um, improved health outcomes from Michigan residents and foster healthy communities. And finally, to create good jobs and reduce costs. So um, the long-term goals of the plan are shown at the, the bottom of this slide. Um, and those are to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions by 52% by 2030, to achieve carbon neutrality by 2050, and to address environmental injustices related to climate. So to achieve these goals, the My Healthy Climate Plan focuses on decarbonizing five industry sectors shown in green on the left. Those are energy, transportation, buildings, energy intensive industries, and natural and working lands. And so these um, industry sectors then align with priority actions um, in the blue column on the right. Um, and we have six of these in the plan. We also call, refer to them as the pil pillars of the plan. And so those industry uh, sectors align with those pillars. And um, the first is actually uh, has its own goals, but then is incorporated throughout the rest of the pillars. And that is a commitment to environmental justice and pursuing a just transition. And uh, we're working to achieve 40% uh, of all uh, state climate benefits will go to low income um, and disadvantaged communities. That's at least 40%. And while it says a goal is by 2030, we're working to work on that right now. The second pillar is to clean the electric grid. And one of the 2030 goals is to achieve 60% renewable generation. The third pillar is to electrify vehicles and increase public transit. There, we'd like to build out the support necessary to have 2 million electric vehicles on Michigan roads by 2030. The fourth pillar is to repair and decarbonize homes and businesses. And by 2030, we'd like to have 2 million buildings retrofitted. The fifth pillar is to drive clean innovation and in industry. And a 2030 goal is to triple Michigan's recycling rate to be 45%. And finally, to protect Michigan's land and water. And the 2030 goal there is to have 30% of Michigan's land and water protected. Um, I'd encourage you, you can read more about these six pillars in the My Healthy Climate Plan in its entirety online. I think we'll be providing some links in the chat. Um, and we'll also be sending out these slides along with additional resources after tonight's event. All right, so Director Ruz alluded to, uh, started talking about the Climate Pollution Reduction Grant Program through EPA. So our My Healthy Climate Plan was released in 2022, and then in 2023, the EPA started this um, $5 billion grant program. So it's been provided to states, local governments, tribes, and territories to develop climate action plans. And there's two parts to this grant program, a non-competitive planning grant, which we've already received, and a competitive implementation grant for which applications are due in April, 2024. As a part of the non-competitive planning grant, we must create a priority climate action plan, which for us is building on the work we've already done to create the My Healthy Climate Plan. And it allows us to continue to receive input that will influence our priority actions and implementation. So you can see on the left there, um, currently we're developing the greenhouse gas inventory and continuing to work on stakeholder engagement of which today's session is one of those events. We plan to release a draft list of the priority greenhouse gas reduction measures in January. Then we'll continue to kind of analyze the impact of those reduction measures as well as other community benefits. And then finally, in the first quarter of 2024, we'll release the priority climate action plan. And then as a part of the planning grant, we'll actually submit a comprehensive climate action plan in 2025. And as I mentioned, there's that competitive implementation grant that we'll be applying to in April, 2024. All right, so this shows where we're at in terms of the stakeholder engagement timeline, work we've done to date and work we're doing um, in 2024. So you see where we are in December, there's those five in-person engagement sessions we've already done across the state. Now we're on the virtual input sessions. We also have a call for projects that's currently open and closes December 20th. And you can submit written comment at any time by email. Our email address is eagle-oce at michigan.gov. Um, so looking past that, we also will have a period for public comment after we release the Priority Climate Action Plan in 2024, which you can see in the kind of bottom tier there. All right, so all of the input that we're getting from these sessions goes towards not only the Priority Climate Action Plan, but other projects and grants we're pursuing related to the goals of the My Healthy Climate Plan, some of which are listed in boxes here. 
as I said before, I'd really encourage you all to read the plan online and to look and see what other resources we have uh, pertaining to the plan and also the Climate Pollution Reduction Grant Program. And we'll have a lot of links in the chat and send others to a follow-up email. But the rest of this session is really an event for us to listen to you all, um, for you to provide input and comment on how you'd like to see the implementation of the climate plan uh, go in our state. So my colleague Sarah and I will be on mute and we will not be providing any response so as to allow as many people as possible the opportunity to provide comment. And Sarah, actually, if you can um, come off mute for a moment, introduce yourself just so folks know who you are. Yeah, hi everyone, it's great to be here. Um, so as Julia said, my name is Sarah. Uh, I use she or they pronouns, I'm fine with either. Um, and I'm within the Office of Climate and Energy, my role being the Climate Data Science Officer. So to add a little bit more color to that, uh, as the name suggests, um, anything sort of data related is my area of expertise, including the uh, statewide greenhouse gas inventory that we're working on. So that's just a little bit about me, but like we said, we wanna hear uh, from you. So I'll pass it back to Julia. Great, thanks, Sarah. Um, with that, I'll actually pass it back to Jim so we can start um, the, the hearing the input from you all. Okay, thanks, Julia. And thank you, Sarah, for coming on. I'm just gonna share my screen here. Hopefully this works, yes, good. All right, so um, just wanna let, just kind of run through some details on how we're gonna do this tonight. We got, oh, it looks like about 70 people logged in right now. We might have a few more logged in. Um, and so we've got a lot of people here. Uh, also with us tonight is uh, Lisa Heron and Jennifer Acevedo. So you might be seeing their names pop up in the chat as they drop some stuff in there. So keep an eye on that. Uh, essentially, what we're going to do tonight is we want to hear from you. So we're going to be here listening. That's our role tonight. We're not going to be really responding back to your comments or your input. Uh, we'll be here listening. And on you'll see our videos on. Good. Uh, and if you... What we're going to do is if you have a comment you'd like to make, you want to provide some input, click the raise hand icon in Zoom. Um, if you're on the phone, and I don't see any phone in callers at this time, I'm just checking. Nope. Uh, if you're on the phone, if you were on the phone, you hit pound two and that'll raise your hand. But if you want to make a comment tonight, raise your hand. And each person is going to get going to be given three minutes to make their comment. Uh, we've got a lot of people that want to comment, so we got to keep this thing moving along. Uh, you'll see a timer that's going to pop up when you start your comment. When you start your comment, please say your name and any organization you might represent, and then just go ahead and get started. What we're going to do is I'll call your name. At that point, we'll unmute you. You'll see your line's been unmuted. And uh, we're also going to put in the name of like the next five people on deck. So if you look and see in the chat, it's going to show who we've got on deck. It'll be like your first name and first initial. That way you'll know that you're coming up. If you decide you don't want to make a comment tonight or you have more to add beyond your three minutes, please note that you can send an email to us at eagle-oce at michigan.gov. That's another good way. Now, when you're making your comment, I'll just let you know this. Uh, when you have one minute left, I'm going to play a little bell. That's when you know you got one minute left. And then when you hit your three minutes, you'll see the timer is three minutes up. And if you don't wrap up, I probably have to break in and let you know. So with that, let's get started. So Julia, Sarah, are you guys ready? All right. So we're going to kick it off. We've got the first person that wants to make a comment is Nicole Kiwe. Bieber or Biber. After that is no Norma Bauer. And yeah. did yeah. you see Michael is at the top? McConnell. Uh, let me scroll up. Oh, yep. Sorry, Michael McConnell is at the top. Sorry, I have to scroll my list. And then Carol, Carolyn. I apologize. I had to scroll my list up. All right. So you should see in the chat <laughs> our uh, people on deck. So uh, Actually, let me I fix this. Uh, I think Michael well. might have gone. So up next, Michael, if you come back, you can go ahead and raise your hand. We'll bring you back. Uh, Carolyn. So Carolyn Bido, you should be unmuted and you can go ahead and make your comment. And Lisa's going to start the timer. So Carolyn Bido, you can unmute your line. I'm so sorry. You can go ahead and skip me. I was not prepared to provide a comment at the moment. <laughs> Okay, we can come back to you. Go ahead and lower your hand. And when you're ready, go ahead and raise your hand again. All right, we'll go to the next person up is Jessica Sharp. 
So Jessica, if you're there, you can unmute your line. Hello? We hear you. You can go ahead and make your comment. Hi, I have spoke to you guys several times about zero transparency, destroying Michigan, and taking the population's rights away. This is a sick plan to establish no rights for the people. We are not in the Hunger Games. We are real people, a large population that has been growing daily. There is no uh, compassion for child labor and destructions of sites in the name of green. We get a three minute comment and I was cut off the last time. Um, $5 billion to compensate for grants that are destroying Michigan. I can tell you in my community, we have been devastated by your plans. I speak for the children. Your happy-go-lucky attitudes are despicable, and it's a desperation to push in tax dollar money that has no benefit to the state of Michigan. We have told you over and over that we do not want this in any of our communities. We have valuable ways to save our environment and you won't even try to reach out to us and speak to us. How many times do we have to talk to you before you will reach out to these communities? There is nothing good about Goshen in Paris, Michigan. Stealing the children's future where they have no voice to speak for themselves. When are you going to take the initiative to care about the people of this community and state? It is absolutely despicable what you're putting the communities through and then patting yourself on the back, acting like it's something great. We don't want smart cities. We don't want smart apartments. We do not want wind and solar monstrosities taking over beautiful environments in Michigan. So I suggest you reach out to Edra of Michigan in these communities and sit down and talk with them and show compassion for the children. Child labor is not acceptable. Three million electric vehicles is not attainable. It is a joke. You guys are ridiculous and we're sick of watching you pat yourself on the back destroying Michigan. All right. Thank you, Jessica, for your comment. I appreciate you uh, wrap, up, wrap it up in three minutes. Thank you. Um, next person up to comment is going to be uh, Nicole Keyway Biber or Bieber. Nicole, are you there? Biber, yes. Biber. Okay. Thank you. All you can right. go ahead and get started whenever you're oh. ready. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Nicole Nindishnikaz, Washington, Bojaba, Moganak Sneoda, Nishnabekwe. So um, I'll begin by uh, quoting the uh, vision of Eagle being an enduring national leader in environmental protection um, and also highlight the 30% protected land and water as a 2030 goal. I would urge. Uh, us to focus on restoration. You know, protection is one thing, but restoration is certainly a more uh, proactive approach. And I think aligned with um, where we find ourselves in the six mass extinction, a biodiversity crisis, um, a national leader, we'd certainly need that considering the United States is not part of the Convention on Biological Diversity, but um, increasingly forest, flora, right, are understood to store, again, another 30, 30% 30 more carbon than realized. So um, I feel like if, if we're, if the, if the intention is to embed climate and all these decisions, I think that a place to start that we really need to is to realize that we depend on living systems, you know, and so prioritize a uh, understanding that we need those living systems, um, the, the flora and the fauna, 
and start there. So the woman who spoke before, I think she, when she said solar monstrosities, it's this idea that somehow technology is going to like be like in the forefront and solve the problems. And when the difficulty that we face is our natural systems are crumbling. And so if, if, if you're thinking about environmental justice as like a, as a person who's indigenous, a tribal citizen, you know, I heard you mention residents. Well, there's like more than human, uh, you know, people or individuals who rely on a functioning ecosystem, rely on Michigan to, you know, have it be where our water is drinkable, where there's, you know, there's air to breathe and things like that. So, you know, I, I personally think wind is better because it's true. There is difficulties with the rare minerals that a huge solar influx would demand. Why not rooftop solar? Because, you know, that may give us some measure of independence from large energy corporations. Why not things like high speed rail rather than saying like suddenly everyone's going to afford a car? So I feel like if we were to do a more low hanging fruit and have it be inherently local responses on the ground work, to prioritize rivers being clean and to prioritize a restoration of biodiversity and habitat that's functional and can really uh, put us in the forefront of a more humble approach and use that money and that investment for a great return on investment of a focus on green infrastructure. Miigwech. Thank you, Nicole, for your comment tonight. Okay, next person up to comment is Norma Bauer. Then after that, it'd be uh, Berta Misserve. So Norma, you should be able to unmute your line. We see you unmuted. And Norma, are you there? I can't hear you. You might wanna check your microphone. Well, I'm showing Norma as unmuted, but we can't hear. Her. So, Norma, I will probably come back to you in just a little bit. Uh, let's go to Berta. Uh, Berta, you can go ahead and unmute your line and make your comment. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. So my um my thing has to do with um actually you showed the picture of the bridge that goes over Lake Michigan. And my idea is that we need to get rid of line five. Um, the, the tunnel is a very terrible idea and it would cause us to have a 99 year lease. And I don't understand how that would have anything to do with what they're doing with COP28, where they are trying to get away from fossil fuels. And yet we would have a 99 year lease for that tunnel if it were to be built. And I'm sure that they're not even considering that. And to be carbon neutral in the future, the pipeline, even as it's running right now, is causing a lot of carbon and methanes to go into the air and causing further climate change. And, um, and if they build the tunnel, the whole process of putting that tunnel underneath the lake bed is craziness. It has never been done before. They have never put a pipeline in a tunnel before and now they think that we should take uh, a chance on doing that with our water i don't think so line five has already leaked over 33 times since 68 and it's been it was built in 53 so how many times did it leak even before um they discovered the leaks and some of them are not even out there so um and when you consider environmental justice what about the indigenous people's rights and their treaties that they have, that they can uh, hunt and fish. And if, if there is an oil leak in the Great Lakes, we are doomed. This is to me, the most important issue of Michigan, not only with uh, the right to women's health care and voting rights and all that, our water is 80% of the Great Lakes or 80% of North America's fresh surface water, and we need our water. We need our water more than we need fossil fuels um, for the next um, next uh, 99 years. So that is my uh, stance, and I appreciate you listening to me. Okay, thanks for your comment tonight, Berta. 
Okay, if you look in the chat, you're going to see the next group of five that are up to comment tonight. Uh, next person up is Elizabeth Benyi, and then it'll be Brett Seabury. So Elizabeth, you are muted on our end. You should be able to. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Excellent. Uh, I want to uh, reiterate what the previous speaker said. And in addition, just make the comment, a commission that just granted the access for the pipeline uh, tunnel, they are not elected officials and they made decisions despite what the general population actually wants. If we lose the Great Lakes, this would be devastating to the entire world, not just to Michigan. The other comment that I want to make is I live up in the Keweenaw and in the entire copper country. And what I mean is, is anything that's west of Marquette, we have really no good, reliable access to recycling at all. I mean, this is just something that's very basic that every human being on the planet can participate in. It's not rocket science. Most of the access that we have, we have to pay to do the recycling. And in fact, I just got a beautiful little color postcard from Eagle about what our options are. And I think some measure has to be done to try to encourage uh, incorporating recycling as a viable business opportunity in the entire copper country so that people don't have to pay just to do recycling. And this is something that's just extremely basic. Uh, that's my only comment. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Elizabeth, for your comment tonight. Okay, next person up is Brett Seabury. And I uh, just want to remind you all, it, when you come up to make a comment, if you please repeat your name, because I may mis misread your name. So I apologize for that. So I want to make sure we get it right in any organization you might be representing. So Brett Seabury and then Jonathan Gingrich. Go ahead, Brett. Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Brett Seabury, and I been a citizen of Michigan here since 1975. And what I want to talk about is recreational boating. Uh, and that's my, that's the focus of my talk. Um, I want everyone to know about the plug boat directory. Uh, the Europeans don't use the term electric boating. They talk about plug boats, which means you can plug them in. Um, the plug boat directory is a manufacturer's list of all the manufacturers of electric boats on the earth. And it's got over a hundred uh, manufacturers and electric motors. It's online. You can go there and, uh, and look at all these manufacturers. Now, most of them are in Europe. Uh, probably almost 100, and there's maybe 25 in the United States area and Canada that are manufacturers of electric boats. And what I'm talking about is recreational boats, uh, motor boats, small boats that you find on our lakes and rivers. Um, the Europeans have huge electric boats, ferries, tugboats, but I'm talking about recreational boating here. Um, and I concern because when we first moved here, we bought a cottage on Torch Lake, which is a beautiful lake. It's a, one of the lakes that was formed by the glaciers. It's, it's clear, it's almost as clear as the Caribbean. And uh, we noticed that Torch Lake does all kinds of things to keep the water clean, but they don't address boating per se. And there's a lot of information about how polluting a recreational boat, a motorboat is. And these little personal watercrafts that you see racing around with kids on them, that's very polluting. So what I want you to do, oh, what, that's what? One minute, okay. One I'm minute, gonna sorry. Talk, I'm going to talk faster, okay. Um, there are boats made in Michigan that are electric. Electric boating is maybe about 5% of the recreational boating. But I have found that we can replace, if people wanted to, every single kind of a recreational boat we have. Some are very, very expensive, but some are not. Uh, there are 
We have a Cress uh, pontoon boats and Owasso makes an electric pontoon boat. Electric pontoon boats are uh, the most common rental boats I see in marinas. Um, and over the last three years, I've sent material around. I'm gonna run out of time here. So let me, you can get a lot of information from my uh, LLC. The name is protectmichiganinlandlakes.com. It's online. You can get a whole lot of information about electric boats. I'm sorry. All right, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Brett, appreciate it. And good okay. comment. Thank you. All right. I uh, just want to remind people as we're going along here, um, because we had several people join since we've gotten started. Right now we're taking comments. We're just going to be listening to your comments as you're making them. Uh, I will be calling you up if you click the raise hand icon. Uh, when it's your turn, I will let you know and I'll let you know you're unmuted. At that point, you're going to see something pop up on your screen that lets you unmute yourself on your end. If you look in the chat, you're going to see who's all on deck to be speaking, commenting next. So keep an eye on the chat. Uh, looks like we do have a person or two on calling in. So if you're calling in on your phone and if you want to make a comment, all you do is hit pound two on your phone, hit pound two, and that will raise your hand and let us know that you want to make a comment. All right, back to our list here. We got Jonathan Gingrich up next. And then after that will be Jesse Deerenwater. Go ahead, Jonathan. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I'm Jonathan Gingrich. Um, I represent the Van Buren Climate Action Team, uh, VBCAT, and uh, I want to talk about distributed energy resources, uh, solar on rooftops and community solar and some things that have been passed legislation and some of it that has been in the works. Um, in terms of the distributed energy resources, um, when you look at the law, the way it's written, they've increased the amount of uh, wind and solar that can be put in there by uh, homeowners and uh, businesses. Um, and then they've changed the uh, uh, way of compensating from net metering and retail in terms of you pay retail, but then you will be compensated by the true cost. Um, so uh, that's going to probably fall on the uh, Public Service Commission to determine how that's figured out. But when we talk about true cost, if we're really actually going to go there, um, the utilities have always had an outsized voice when it comes to that. We need to consider things like that, that there are benefits to the utilities. They're going to be able to have smaller transmission lines, towers, because the energy doesn't have to travel as far. They can charge... Uh, the same delivery fees to people who are getting the spillover energy from a nearby DRE um, as if they had generated it miles away, even though they probably shouldn't. Um, there's less wear and tear on existing lines and switches and relays as we spread those uh, energy resources farther away. Um, there's a lower need for peaker plants because you've got people generating electricity during that peak time. So that saves the utilities. Um, there's, uh, the, the people that are just generating electricity at the end of the line should probably be compensated more than those that are near the power plant. Um, the, the distributed energy resources, that equipment monitors the voltage and can alert, uh, of an over voltage. It cleans up the sine wave. That's a benefit to the power company. And then you have cleaner air and soil and water. You don't have, uh, coal-fired power plants spewing mercury all over the place. There's less asthma, there's uh, fewer heart and lung uh, ailments. Um, there's increased reliability and resiliency, especially if we can go to microgrids. So all of that should be considered. And then if we get to community solar, I need the state to really consider putting their money where their mouth is and building um, renewables out into the state, uh, especially on public school buildings and in uh, a public school parking lots at the state's expense. Don't, don't burden the schools with that. If, you know, if, if this is gonna be a benefit for the community and a benefit for the state, then sell bonds, cash in some pot revenue, whatever it is, but um, make that happen and you will, you will set, uh, make it may, way easier on the um, state in terms of infrastructure. And then for small scale solar farms, you're gonna have uh, people coming in from outside writing contracts. There needs to be some laws or statutes or rules 
to mandate some best practice contracts so you don't have uh, unscrupulous actors coming in and leaving us burdened with uh, decommissioning these things, things like that. All right, thank you. <laughs> appreciate your time. All right. Thank you, Jonathan. I appreciate you keeping an eye on time there. All right. Uh, next person up to comment tonight is Jesse Deer and Water. And then after that is Margot Hayes. So, Jesse, you're unmuted. You can go ahead whenever you're ready. All right. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Jesse Deer and Water. Uh, I live in North Redford, Michigan. Uh, I'm a citizen of the Cherokee Nation of Oklahoma, but I am involved with a lot of the indigenous and native tribes here in Michigan and communities and things that are going on. And uh, uh, one thing that I see that's missing from this whole plan that you all have is honoring the treaties that the United States of America has with the indigenous tribes, the 12 federally recognized tribes of the state. Nowhere in here do I see anything about engaging them, uh, finding out what the folks' wishes are. I mean, if you stop and you think about it for a second, the combined uh, revenue and tax payments that go into the state from these 12 federally recognized tribes is pretty large, and there's probably not a bigger combined source out there of uh, contributions to the state as far as different things go and to schools. And so I'm not seeing anything in here that specifically names the 12 federally recognized tribes and the debt, the moral debt that the state of Michigan owes to them to not only get their input, but to also make sure that these lands are protected in the future. I heard the woman earlier talking about they don't want solar in their fields, this, that, and the other. Uh, you want this 30% land saved, you know, produce more rooftop solar for us in the urban communities so that we can offset the need for rural solar. Uh, there's a there, there's there's a lot here. Uh, I don't I don't see anything in environmental justice. Whose environment has this been for 10,000, 100,000 years? Uh, this has been the indigenous people who believe that they were lowered down from the stars in this area. Uh, you owe this moral and actual debt to the people, the indigenous people, the original people of this land by engaging them and taking more input from them and not even not even acknowledging them in this. Uh, the MPSC just passed the tunnel resolution there uh, in the Straits of Mackinac for line five. All 12 of the tribes in the state uh, are against that uh, tunnel and against that pipeline. That's a spit in their face. This too will be a spit in their face and it will not only be that, but it will also be a horrible tragedy for the state of Michigan to not engage the indigenous people and its claim to be progressive. Uh, well, yeah, yeah. So, uh, uh, and, and so some of my different issues here are uh, uh, for pillar two, cleaning the electric get grid, long approval times prevent deployment on the time scale needed. And you guys, solution says, improve the siting process to expedite required approvals. That would mean that there would be all, it, these processes would forego and eliminate uh, uh, important environmental impact studies, uh, community input by fast tracking and expediting what could be potentially dirty energy being called clean, like nuclear or gas or carbon capture, yada, yada. Uh, uh, and, and, uh, yeah, yeah. So, 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 so that's, that, that's basically all I got, you know, for yeah. right now, uh, uh, also, uh, in protecting, uh, Michigan. Hey, Jesse, land we're going to have to, we're going to have to cut you off now. I'm sorry. All right. But in the so, land and water, yeah. there's no engagement with the indigenous people either. All right. We appreciate your comment, Jesse. And for you or anybody else, if you'd like to make more extensive comments, Remember, you can put them in, send it in via email. Uh, the email address is on your screen, eagle-oce at michigan.gov. And just to let you know, whether you're making your comments verbally tonight or via email, if they hold the same weight, we're going to be looking at them all. So just to want to let you guys know that. All right. Um, also an update, we've got about 64 people logged in listening right now. Um, I've currently got eight hands raised. So the next person up to make a comment is Margot Hayes. And then after Margot is Taylor Van Winkle. So Margot, you should be able to unmute your line. 
have here. blue. It's here. There, there you go. We can hear you. <laughs> Um, my husband had his hand on the screen. I couldn't see where to go. He was you figured it out. <laughs> um, go okay. ahead. Um, thank you for doing this. Um, we've had a brutal battle over solar siting here in West Michigan. I'm in Montague, Michigan, near White River Township. And I would just urge you first for the Public Service Commission rules and the implementation of their um, <clears throat> policies to move forward when people are uh, fighting back at the local level against something that really makes sense, but they aren't educated enough to understand it, uh, that uh, those rules in expediting the process be very, uh, a, a priority very soon. And that um, you really have a process to look at communities that have already uh, zoned out solar in various maybe devious ways and and deal with those first. Uh, second, the barrier of people's perception is huge. And I don't know how you educate around that, but education clearly has to be part of this. People don't understand that they're not going to be able to let their kids play outside in the summer. Uh, and they're saying, I don't want to look at solar panels. Uh, and that's more important than it being too hot to be able to even enjoy your environment. And so the, the shared good of what you are doing really takes a lot of education. I don't know how you do that, but that needs to be a component. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to see uh, a better, clear development of mechanisms that would um, benefit community solar. and. Um, I think that smart grid is part of that. And I haven't heard much, much discussion or education about it and how community solar can benefit individuals, even if they can't put solar on their home, they can buy into a com community system. One of your speakers uh, talked about distributed energy resources. I think this is kind of in the same topic area and um, particularly prioritizing communities that are historically um, hurt by the decisions for the environment that have been made and to educate them and help bring them into community solar usage. Finally, uh, we've also had a battle up here about pollution of the waters of Lake Michigan through CAFO waste. And uh, people uh, need to understand the negative impact of CAFOs. And also I would like to see um, eagles uh, you have a department that regulates the CAFOs, and I'd like to see a policy that doesn't allow the large animal uh, feed operations that so pollute anywhere near Lake Michigan or the Great Lakes. Uh, thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Margo, for your comment tonight. Okay. Uh, next up is going to be uh, Taylor Van Winkle and then Rita Mitchell. So, Taylor... You should be able to unmute your line. There you go. Go ahead. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Excellent. Hello. I'm Taylor Van Winkle. I'm the Climate Sustainability Coordinator for Kalamazoo County. Um, I'll just speak briefly on a short list of priorities that the Climate Pollu Pollution Reduction Grant requirements um, are identifying and the My Healthy Climate Plan identifies and the county pri um, priorities are identified. So I'll just talk about a short list. I'll also be sending written remarks to your email as well. So um, don't worry about wanting more information or whatever. I'll send it um, following this talk. So for Kalamazoo County, what would be really um, beneficial to prioritize um, for implementation would be expanding programs to divert waste organic waste um, from landfills and that aligns with um, you know cutting food waste by 50 percent and the, the clean innovation um, and industry. Um, another priority that is identified across all three would be expanding and developing transportation infrastructure projects to facilitate public transit, micromobility, car sharing, bicycle, and pedestrian modes to increase public transit across the board. Um, incentive, incentive programs for implementation of energy efficiency measures. So that's for government buildings, that's for residential, commercial, uh, industrial buildings. So across all of those sectors. And then programs and policies to accelerate the incorporation of efficient electrical technologies and electric vehicle charging. So electric 
infrastructure expansion programs. All of those are prioritized across all three. And we would um, at the county would look into putting in project ideas for that coming next early next year when the C CPRG project ideas are, are going to be um, submitted. So again, I'll send in written remarks as well, expanding on those ideas. And we'll likely submit um, project ideas to the Open Eagle survey right now. So um, thank you for your time. I really appreciate it. OK, thanks, Taylor, for your comment. OK, next up is going to be Rita Mitchell. Then Paige Smalley is after that. I think we had in the list that said Stephen Graves, but I uh, must have jumped out of line or maybe didn't want to make a comment. So if you're following along in the chat, um, you'll see. Um, sometimes people lower their hands. So, all right, Rita Mitchell, you're on mute. Go ahead. Hi, this is Rita Mitchell. I live in Ann Arbor and I am a member of Craft Citizens Resistance at Fermi 2 and Washtenaw 350. Um, here's my concern is that the a, a top priority has to be to listen to the climate justice communities. The Justice 40 is a good idea, but really start action on it soon. Um, we are in a climate emergency and across everything I observe here in Michigan, nationwide, worldwide, I don't see enough urgency. I don't see the action. So I urge you to move quickly. Um, I think we should focus on energy efficiency as soon as possible. It's one of the least costly and most beneficial things we can do, the energy that we don't have to produce. Um, I am seriously concerned and very beyond disappointed in the MPSC's decision to support a line to five tunnel, which will prolong the use of fossil fuels far into the future. Really bad idea and risky, risky for the state all along the line of that pipeline. Um, the, another aspect that I um, want to call to your attention is the um, use of nuclear power, which is extremely expensive and risky. It pollutes all along its path. One could say that it is carbon free, but it is not. Extraction production, refining, transportation, and then the lack of an ability to store nuclear materials after being used is way beyond what we should be doing and way too risky to our health and to our environment. And we should shut down all of the nuclear power plants. I want to also agree with what I heard about the biogas, and which is methane, one of the most pop polluting um, gases that we have. And we need to cut out that and stop including biogas as an option in the energy package. That just encourages CAFOs. That will pollute our land and water. There's no doubt about it. We should. We have to shut those down. Um, so please stop that um, and refine this program. And please, please, please listen to the message you heard from Nicole Biber about biodiversity. We have to retain our biodiversity or we'll all be in serious problem. So it's bad enough as it is. Let's stop doing things that affect the creatures with whom we share our earth. Thank you. All right, thank you, Rita. Okay, up next on the list here for raised hands is Paige Smalley and then Hort Smith. So Paige, you should be able to go now. Okay, thank you. You're able to hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you for the time to speak. Uh, my name is Paige Smalley. I'm representing Henry Ford Health, um, Detroit. So to Within where our hospital is located, we're in the second poorest con congressional district in Michigan. Uh, many of our residents and patients um, have a lot of health ailments. We are known as a asthma capital um, in terms of all of the industries that are around and the waste that they produce into the air, into the water. Um, one of the efforts we're making in trying to fill out this form um, within the Michigan Healthy Climate Plan and giving some of our input is trying to be more um, 
carbon neutral. We've signed the Justice 40 pledge and we're in the process of expanding out our hospital campus because of the existing infrastructure. We've been in the area for a hundred years. Um, the infrastructure is not able to hold the new technology or new you know, waste streams that come with trying to be more environmental friendly. So it's seeking now to expand and um, to allow us to provide better pay or better service for our patients. Um, a few of the issues that we've been having is with recycling being one of them. Uh, it's no secret that healthcare industries um, produce a ton of waste and trying to do a, it in a way that um, has safe disposal, is very legal, healthy, and environmental friendly. So trying to incorporate more recycling practices um, and also seeking more green building initiatives, um, trying to make our hospital system 100% carbon neutral. Um, it's important for us as well as a part of our mission, if we are going to be giving care to the community, we also don't want to be the resource that is hurting the community. Um, so i um, looking forward to submitting some project ideas and trying to push this forward to encourage more health systems to um, bring these efforts into the urban environment and into the city. So I thank you for your time. All right. Thank you, Paige. Okay, next up is Horst Schmidt and then Laura uh, Sesa. Horst, you should be able to unmute your yes, line. There you go. I, thank you. Um, my name is Horst Schmidt. I'm in Holton on the south shore of uh, Lake Superior. And um, I'm, uh, I'm a former president of um, the Upper Peninsula Environmental Coalition. And I've also been involved with the Governor's Climate Solutions Council. And from that, I, I've gathered that, you know, the state has done quite a good, good job in terms of, of getting on top of it. However, I noticed when the um, IRA was um, implemented that there were hundreds of programs at least, and it seems that no one has taken any time to put together a list and breaking it down into uh, something that, that people can figure out how whether it's for them or for a company or for the government. And so I, I would recommend that uh, the state uh, either do it or have, find, find someone who has done, break it broken down the RRA and the BIL um, programs so that we're able to take maximum advantage of it. And I think if, if you could get a uh, you know, contract um, agency to to do it as as you did with the great plains institute and have them go to the counties so that the counties the townships the cities have an opportunity to basically find out what's available because when i talk to my uh, county commissioners that doesn't seem like they're fully aware and and i don't see any anything uh in in the area of our township and since they're so constricted in terms of having having adequate uh uh, personnel to run run their uh, uh, counties and their townships and cities. We really need to provide them with as much support as as possible. Uh, the uh, Michigan Environmental Council has has a, a person looking to build a human infrastructure for energy efficiency and electrification in Elger County. We're trying to see if that model will work. So if, if this is this is an example where we. Uh, you know, want to want to get local uh, people involved in this rather than having uh, the the sphere or uh, subversion of of um, anger at the government uh, saying saying they're taking over. We want people to take over and have their own destiny uh, made by making their own decisions. So I really appreciate it if you would take a look at at how you're running out your programs. And uh, thank you very much. All right, thanks for your comment, Horst. Okay, next up is Laura Sesa, and then it'd be Brandy Sweet. Just wanna let you know, we'll be dropping in the next group of people into the chat in just a minute here. So go ahead, Laura. All right, can you hear me? Yes, we can. All right, my name is Laura Sesa. I use they, them pronouns, and I live in Grand Rapids. Um, I am a member of Strong Towns Grand Rapids, but today I'm making comments um, for myself. I do want to commend 
at Eagle for taking this important step in Michigan's transition to clean energy. Um, and today I'd like to address the transportation pillar of the plan. I think it is short-sighted to focus almost exclusively um, on the conversion of our vehicle fleet to electric. Um, while this may have a beneficial impact on greenhouse gas tailpipe emissions, electric vehicles nonetheless come with their own negative impacts on the climate. Um, EV battery production can lead to a loss of biodiversity and air pollution on its own, and mining for the necessary minerals to make these batteries can also damage ecosystems. And finally, as EVs are heavier, the lifespan of their tires is shorter and they wear down faster. Tire wear is one of the largest sources of microplastics entering the environment. So, and not to mention that as these vehicles become taller and heavier, pedestrian safety is also negatively impacted with more private vehicles on the road. I would instead like to encourage the plan to prioritize reducing private vehicle dependency by increasing access to public transit and safe micro mobility. This would include greatly expanding access to passenger rail in the state with both additional high speed routes um, needed to better connect our communities, as well as um, uh, improving the, the routes that we do have. I would also urge funding for cities to implement protected bike and micro mobility infrastructure and encourage the state to provide tax or purchase incentives um, for e-bikes, which are by far the most popular and efficient electric vehicle on the market today. I think that we can only reach um, these ambitious goals that you've laid out um, to combat climate change by reducing dependency on private vehicles for transportation. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Okay, Brandy Sweet is up next, and then Stephen Graves. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, we can, Brandy. Go ahead. Hi, um, I'm from Macosta County, where the said uh, Goshen EV battery factory is coming. Um, I would like to say that I'm glad to hear that the Native American Water Treaty Act is being brought up tonight, um, because with these EV battery factories and this whole clean um, energy transition that we are going through right now, um, you know, the whole supply chain is pretty toxic from the lithium mining to cobalt that's needed to the synthetic graphite. Um, and then when you talk about bringing that all here and starting to manufacture those batteries here, especially here, um, in my community, Macasta County with Goshen, I have called and spoke with Eagle numerous um, occasions. And this factory wants to be built atop of 60 acres of wetlands on a Dizelle Creek that is a main tributary to the Muskegon River. Um, there has been no consideration. There is no EIS environmental impact statement um, attached to this factory. Um, I don't understand why things would be more fast-tracked rather than due diligence being brought with any transition. I understand that the way that the environment is and the things that we are doing with all these industries and the climate change and toxification tax of the world is real, but is this the right transition, especially at this fast-tracked pace with no consideration being taken. There is no cons local community support um, being taken. I would like to suggest that EGLE develop a new model and set concrete criteria for community resident stakeholder engagement, which takes place before state and local agencies target communities for specific development plans. This program needs to be administered by local officials and residents, not by state agencies. We have seen here um, that they say local community support was supposed to have been taken into consideration for this EV battery mega site. And we are not the only community here in Michigan. They are coming to five other communities looking to just force themselves upon an unwanted community. I will try to summarize in the minute that local community support needs to be taken into consideration. Rewilding needs to be taken into consideration. Brown zones need to be thought about before going to green spaces and ruining more of our nature. And the water usage for these EV battery mega, uh, manufacturing facilities really needs to be taken in consideration because the amount of water usage is astronomical. And our aquifers are really looking at being endangered here along with the toxification from the chemicals. Thank you. 
Thanks for your comment, Brandy. Okay, just to let everybody know we've got uh, <clears throat> we've got three more people with their hands up. Stephen Graves, Nancy Stencil, and Mark Richardson. If you'd like to make a comment, please be sure to raise your hand and we'll make sure we I'll meet your lines. So uh, coming up next is Stephen Graves. So Stephen, you are unmuted on our end. You can go out and meet your line and make your comment. Go ahead, Stephen. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Yeah, perfect. All right. Hey, thank you for um, putting this event together, first of all. And, and my name is Stephen Graves, and I'm representing myself. Um, we do have a farm in uh, Manistee County. But I wanted to comment on uh, the force management um, efforts in Michigan. And right now, it looks like the only um, program that's using um, carbon credits of any kind is mostly the forestry program. And there's a few other small ones. And I did notice that there were 11 projects right now tied to carbon credits um, using a, a managed service called a new climate. Um, and they're minting the carbon credits and it's for basically, you know, leaving the trees uh, vertical versus cutting them down and you get a credit for that. And if you look at the cap and trade program that started in 2006 in California, it really helped them. Um, it's helping them to meet their objectives on reducing, um, you know, the greenhouse gases. And my comment is, you know, looking at your, your plan and looking at some of the, the programs coming out of um, most recently the Inflation Reduction Act and the funding behind a lot of the, the grants that are being um, made available today to uh, governments, townships, Indian tribes, you know, all the eligible applicants. Um, I don't see in there anything that's establishing a low cost um service for uh, carbon credits as an incentive for either equipment manufacturers or, uh, to build more efficient products or landowners or anything that's um, Michigan statewide, um, including heat pumps, things like that. And uh, I'm, I'm curious as to why, or, or maybe this hasn't come out yet, Michigan um, isn't interested in from a statewide perspective uh, supporting some kind of a carbon uh, credit plan, like a cap and trade plan, like the program that California has, because it does incentivize uh, people to um, be think green. My father in law, for example, does that mean I have a minute left? Yeah, okay. So my father in law has about 160 acres up in the UP, and every year he gets a check for about $800 just for leaving his trees vertical. And, you know, it's, it is an incentive for behaving with a concern for the environment that is um, obviously available. And it seems like in government, the only people taking advantage of it is uh, USDA forest programs. And maybe you guys could take a look at this in the future because um, those uh, tools for minting carbon credits and reducing the cost and making that available as a government service are readily available. Um, at a low cost and also open source. That's, that's all I have to say. And keep up the good work, by the way. All right. Thank you, Stephen, yeah. for your comments yeah. tonight. Okay, Nancy Stencil's up next, and then Mark Richardson will be on after Nancy. Hey, thank you. Are you able to hear me all right? Yep, go ahead. Okay. Um, my name is Nancy Stencil. I'm with the Mining Impact Coalition, and we're grassroots. And I would just like to say that, you know, water is a source and it's very essential to our survival. And I am having a very hard time understanding why anyone would want to allow a Canadian mining company the possibility of coming in to the Porcupine State Park and mining there. And, you know, for sure, it's going to destroy the waters of Lake Superior with sulfide bearing rock, waste rock. Um, Highland would be the closest to Lake Superior, and any breach would definitely be a disaster. And, you know, it will happen regardless of, of regulations. There's never been a sulfide mine that has not polluted. 
Um, mining itself is not going to fight climate change, uh, quite the opposite. I feel that mining is the number one threat to any biodiversity. It is not going to create jobs. Um, people are generally brought in. Any jobs that are given are always short term. Uh, meanwhile, if you would really take a look at tourism industry there, um, tourism is, is your number one. It makes 10 times the amount of money that a mine will ever make you. And um, I just, I hope you will really take these things into consideration. Predominantly Highland Copper, but also like the, the back 40. And uh, that's all I have. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. Okay, thanks, Nancy. All right, next up is Mark Richardson, then Rick Sadler. Mark, you should be able to unmute your line. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Uh, my name is Mark Richardson. I'm with the uh, City of Berkeley Environmental Advisory Committee, and uh, that's a a, a duly constituted committee of the city of Berkeley. It's not a assist and volunteer organization. So I'm saying that to stress that my comments here are my own opinion and, and I'm not speaking for the committee. Um, what I have is real quick, I'd like to echo the comment of Horst Schmidt, I believe it was, on the importance of uh, communication with local units of government uh, the, um, the provisions of the Inflation Reduction Act and the, uh, the, the uh, Healthy Climate Plan and the uh, legislation that's uh, recently been enacted uh, by the state of Michigan uh, are, are dizzying. <laughs> they are uh, covering um, so much uh, territory. Uh, we really need an effort uh, to simplify and explain uh, opportunities for local governments uh, to participate in, in this effort. Um, and I just add that um, the, the city that I'm with, uh, the city of Berkeley is a small community. So uh, there are many, many small communities, both in, in urban areas like, like mine and, and rural areas of Michigan that could um, benefit from prioritizing, um, you know, joint grant applications, joint loan applications, um, opportunities to work together with uh, other units of government on, on, on pro projects that um, uh, are available under these various programs. So um, I would like the department to give some consideration to uh, the needs of smaller communities um, and uh, uh, that's just my comment. Thank you very much. Great, thanks, Mark. Okay, Rick Sadler's up next. And then after Rick, it'd be Martin uh, Kushler. So Rick, you should be unmuted now. Rick, you can go ahead. All right, we're not hearing you, Rick. So we are going to see, you might want to check your settings on your microphone and um, we'll come back to you later. So I'm just gonna go up to uh, Martin Kushler, Kushler next and then Marjorie Steele. So Martin, you should be able to unmute your line. All right. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Go ahead. Very good. Yeah, I'm Marty Kushler. I'm with the American Council for Energy Efficient Economy. Uh, and I want to thank Eagle for all the work that you're doing on implementing the climate plan. This is a very important uh, objectives here. My interest area is in the building retrofit pillar. I have two specific comments. First, I want to strongly recommend that Eagle take steps to make sure that our utility companies are fully involved in Michigan's efforts to capture the large amounts of federal funds that are available for improving the energy efficiency of homes and businesses. 
Our Michigan Utility Energy Efficiency Programs are some of the best in the nation, but without careful planning and design of the efforts that EGLE is developing, there are obstacles to utilities taking advantage of the federal rebates and integrating them into their programs. So please make sure that utilities are fully integrated. The second, uh, there are many different departments and organizations involved in various aspects of providing building efficiency improvements and repairs in Michigan. Typically, they each operate in their own silos, which creates both duplication and missed opportunities for combining efforts. I've long recommended that the governor designate a weatherization czar who would have the authority to oversee all state departments involved in this type of work and work to improve communication and integration of services among state agencies, as well as local governments and non-government organizations that are involved in building repair and energy retrofit work. So I hope that EGLE can, can work to help create that kind of oversight and coordination function. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Martin. Kim, I got a couple more hands up here. Uh, so let's go to Marjorie Steele. Marjorie, go ahead. You should be able to unmute your line. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear you fine. Okay, that's great. Um, Marjorie Steele here, uh, founder of the Economic Development Responsibility Alliance of Michigan. Um, I will be uh, following up uh, my comments here via email. Um, so, you know, plenty of opportunity to go into more detail there. Um, we do want to, you know, propose some solutions, particularly in line with the uh, CPRG program. Um, I also wanted to acknowledge that uh, it's my understanding that uh, most of the staff on the uh, Office of Climate and Energy are are brand new. <laughs> um, so, you know, I, I kind of wanted to welcome you. And I, and I also wanted to just acknowledge that there's a lot of angst in the Michigan community um, that's been, you know, developing with EGLE based on a lot of past projects. And I just want to recognize that you folks are inheriting that. Um, and that's not necessarily anything that you earned. Um, so just kind of want to acknowledge that. Um, from our perspective, there's a, a, a few critical issues that um, the MI Healthy Climate Plan, I should say specifically the proposed solutions have right now. And they really boil down to, um, as many commenters have observed already, um, water usage and biodiversity and habitat loss, as well as uh, lack of stakeholder input, um, specifically in regards to the centralized uh, wind and solar energy grids and uh, to the EV transition. Um, I believe you've heard a lot of feedback from your stakeholders about the unfeasibility of EV, you know, starting with the supply chain going all the way up to consumer costs. Um, what hasn't been discussed a great deal is the huge biodiversity and habitat loss that will come from uh, the EV and semiconductor megasites that have been planned in the locations where they've been planned to go. Um, no environmental impact statements, and, and I think really critically, no updated water studies on our statewide aquifers, which we are looking at drawing um, the MEDC's six uh, EV megasites planned across the state between 50 to 150 million gallons of water a day. Um, I think this definitely prompts an environmental impact study. The other really, I think, critical part uh, of, of the plan where, where the solutions have it wrong, um, but there's where there's also a great deal of opportunity to innovate and honestly to use this funding in a really good way that I, I really genuinely hope you take advantage of is the, the proposed centralization of the grid. Um, you know, anyone who really understands climate science and you know, the, the simple physics, frankly, can understand that the most sustainable future is a decentralized grid that is focusing on a diversity of renewable, uh, you know, energies and sources. And I, I just cannot emphasize this enough. Your local agriculturalists and farmers are the best experts and your tribes are the best experts on this. And I just encourage you to lean into that expertise. Um, good luck, you guys. And thanks for your time. Thank you, Marjorie. Okay, next up we have Rick Sadler. We'll try Rick again. And then if anybody else would like to make a comment tonight, please raise your hand now. Okay, Rick, go ahead and try to unmute your line and hopefully you can get back on here. Okay, doesn't look like we got Rick able to communicate. 
our Amita line. So, um, Rick, if you do want to make a comment and for some reason you're having troubles, again, you can just email us uh, at the email uh, box. Uh, it's on your screen, eagle-oce at michigan.gov. Okay, uh, we have a person with their hand raised, Rachel Kucheri Murray. Rachel, wow, I'm really impressed that you. I'm impressed that you pronounce that so well. Thank you. Um, <laughs> yeah, it gets better as I go along. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to make a short comment about um, the fact that um, I think there's a current law in the books that limits the amount of solar panels that a private property owner can put on their rooftop to um, what they're able to use or some some formula around that. And uh, my understanding that th is that that is limiting people in um, the possibilities of what they can feed back into the grid and that that's not, that's not something that the energy companies have produced that is actually coming from state law. So I think that, I, I don't know if, if that's something that you guys have any power over or, or that you can send it up, you know, to people who can do something about it, but that that could be limiting us. There's so many, um, you know, farm facilities, capos that have huge long roofs that could be used instead of putting it out in the fields. Um, you know, I agree with a lot of people that it it's not attractive to have solar farms, but um, the limitations um, can are holding us back from doing what we could do in a more attractive way. And the other thing is um, if you could produce um, maybe some recommendations and guidelines to give to townships as they're setting their rules around the solar farms, um, they don't always know what, you know, they're, they don't always know what, what's the best rules to, to, um, and to create, and they may be creating rules that are unnecessarily um, making worse conditions, you know, like if you stack it higher, then you can put them further apart and then you can grow things in between. Um, whereas a lot of them are trying to keep them shorter because they think that's going to be more attractive, but then that means that that land can't be used because um, they're closer together. So things like that, if maybe you guys could help coach townships as they're creating their ordinances, that would be helpful. Um, and I also agree with all of the comments about biodiversity and not allowing the tunnel to go through for line five, because that's just moving in a backwards direction. So thank you very much for having this. Thank you for all the work that you're doing. And we appreciate you. Great. Thanks, Rachel. Okay, I'm going to give it one just a couple seconds here to see if anybody else has a comment they would like to make. And you can go ahead and raise your hand if you do. And just to be fair to everyone, um, you know, only if you've not made a comment yet. <laughs> if you're watching this with a group of people and somebody else in your household wants to make a comment, feel free to raise your hand and we can put them on the line as well. Okay. Well, I want to thank everyone for uh, being so respectful and conscientious of the time and letting everybody, each other speak and giving each other plenty of time and room to speak tonight. All right, I'm going to turn it back over to Julia. And so, Julia, I know you asked a few wrap-up things to, to go through. So go ahead and share your screen again. And go ahead. Great. There. Can you see my slides, Jim? Yep. You're back. Awesome. Okay. I uh, just want to thank everyone for taking the time to, to spend part of your Thursday evening with us and providing comment. We really appreciate it. Um, and if you're looking for more ways to stay involved, you can use this QR code. It'll take you to the My Healthy Climate Plan Hub, which is a website with a lot more information. Um, we also encourage you all to subscribe to our Michigan Climate Action News and Updates. And once again, want to remind you that we have um, a call for projects that's open now and will close December 20th. And if you want more information on the Climate Pollution Reduction Grant Program, we actually had a previously recorded webinar on this topic, um, which you can refer to. And we also have a, a website with the frequently asked questions around that grant program. And then finally, as we've said many times, we do want to encourage you to email us at eagle-oce at michigan.gov. And I believe that's everything we have. Thank you again. Thanks, Julia uh, and Sarah. 
I just want to put one more reminder out there that if for some reason you didn't catch one of the emails or didn't catch anything we mentioned, uh, Jennifer Acevedo is going to be sending a follow-up to everyone who registered tonight, even if they didn't attend, to uh, get them a link to the recording and also send any of these links that we just shared. So thank you, everybody, for spending some time with us tonight and sharing your thoughtful comments. We appreciate you. Uh, have a great rest of your evening. Thank you.